Well, good morning, Meadowbrook. How are we doing this morning? It's good to see all of you here with us. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you're with us this morning. So this is Amanda Riley, and in 2012, she was expecting the birth of her first child, and she was eagerly anticipating uh, all of what motherhood would bring, those unhurried days with her new one around the house, just getting to soak in the beauty and the preciousness of a little child, looking forward to walks in the stroller, taking her little one out into the community and introducing their, their new little one to the great, wonderful, wide world that exists. Well, leading up to the birth of her first child, she started to not feel well, and that's common for people who are pregnant. Uh, But this went beyond regular pregnancy pain or discomfort, and after a variety of tests, she was diagnosed with lupus, which is an autoimmune disease where your immune system basically attacks your body. And so um, she found that out leading up to her, the birth of her first son. And so she gave birth, trying to like adjust to motherhood as well as like figure out how to navigate this disease. And somewhere along the way, um, sure, she went in for some tests and her blood count dipped and got kind of unusually low. And that was a catalyst for another series of tests where she ultimately was diagnosed with cancer. She was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so for the next year, she battled this cancer, did treatment regularly, and adjusted to being a new mom. But somewhere along the way in that first year of fighting, she also had this perspective of maybe I could be a source of hope for people. Maybe I could kind of take what I'm experiencing and look at it differently and actually help people through their own pain and suffering. So this was 2012. Um, Instagram was just getting started. TikTok wasn't a thing. So blogs and Facebook were like the big social media outlets. So she started a blog and just started to write about her journey. And very quickly, thousands of people started reading and following her blog. People appreciated the authenticity with what writing about her, what she was experiencing. They appreciated the vulnerability. At the same time, also noticing that she was incredibly optimistic and courageous and like was this ray of sunshine as she was going through this really challenging thing. So after a year of battling, as you crossed into like the spring of 2023, her cancer went away, went into remission. And it was just this great cause for celebration. Uh, But after about six months, as they moved into the summer of 23, it came back. And what made the reoccurrence of it that much more scary was that she also found out that she was pregnant, expecting her second child. And so she was worrying, like, how, am I, how is the treatment that I need to do going to affect my pregnancy? What's going to happen to this little one that's inside me as I try and get healthy? So over the course of the next year, continued to fight, continued to battle. Her blog continued to spread. The the support that came around here was incredible. People just started to send money. People started to send gift cards. As she would travel to different places for treatment, people would recognize her and just walk up to her and offer all sorts of things. Uh, People started posting pictures of hashtag Team Amanda, sending them to her. And then they, they put all these pictures to music. You remember that song, Fight Song? This is my fight song. Take Back My Life song, Prove That I'm All Right song, this like kind of inspirational video behind this song of all these people supporting her. She was even involved in a church community and was given opportunity to give testimony about what God was doing in her and through her during this season, during this battle, regular updates, you know, every few months of just what was going on. And the church came around her, supported her in incredible ways, giving her money, praying for her, doing childcare, running errands for her, whatever they could do. Now, what was even more incredible than the support that she was given, what was even more incredible than her story, and even more incredible than the influence that she had, was that everything that she was saying was a complete lie. She was never diagnosed with lupus. Never had it. Never diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Never had cancer. From 2012 to 2020, she was propagating this lie of having this illness, scamming hundreds of people 
for their finances and support. For, during those eight years, she scammed hundreds of people out of well over $100,000. There was an investigative journalist who came across her blog and started to read it, just noticing something seemed a little off and started to dig into it, noticed some inconsistencies, started to dig into it a little bit more, and eventually found out this lady is full-on telling one big lie and has been for eight whole years. She was eventually uh, prosecuted. She was taken to court and eventually convicted of fraud and has been serving at least a five to eight year sentence for scamming people out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so the question is, how would you respond? Like, what would you feel if you were the people who faithfully read her blog? Like, how would you respond to that? Like, what if you were some of the people who sent her money or posted pictures? Or what if you were a part of her church community? How would you feel if you listened to her give testimony and felt like, oh, we need to support her and take care of her kids and run errands for her? What would you feel if you were the pastor who gave her the microphone and gave her stage time? I mean, I think the word that describes how they would feel is betrayed flat out betrayed. Now, what if you knew it was going on, though? Like, what if in real time you knew that this individual was scamming people, it was all a big lie? How would you respond? Would you confront that individual? Would you call the police? Would you start an investigation? What would you do if you knew that it was a lie and she was knowingly betraying people? Now, as Christians, we're called to emulate Jesus. We're called to follow Jesus. We're called to live our life the way that Jesus lived. And in John 13, Jesus knows. He full-on knows that betrayal against him in real time is happening. And the way that he responds is very different. And it raises a question for us. Should we respond in that same way? way. Now, once you cross into John 13, it kind of marks a new section in John's gospel. And what's happening in John 13 is Jesus is having one final evening with his disciples before he will go to the cross. And this evening with them centers around a meal. And during this meal, Jesus is teaching them a variety of things. It's the last teaching opportunity he will have with his disciples before he dies. And he's giving, him, giving them his final words, so to say. Now, the first thing that he does and the first thing that he teaches them isn't something that he says, but it's something that he does because as the meal is in progress, he gets up from his seat and he goes one by one and washes all of the disciples' feet. And then he comes to Peter. And Peter is taken aback by what Jesus is doing. He's like, Jesus, you're going to wash my feet? Essentially saying, Jesus, you shouldn't wash my feet. I should be washing yours. And Jesus responds to Peter saying, hey, unless I wash your feet, you will have no part of me. And so Peter, being Peter, enthusiastically responds back, okay, well, not just my feet, but my head and my hands as well. Wash it all. I'm all in. So give me a bath, Jesus. And Jesus says, well, those who have already had a bath only need their feet washed. And he says, you are clean. Kind of speaking not just to Peter, but everybody there. He's saying, you are clean because of the words I have spoken to you. But then he says this in verse 18. Although I am not referring to all of you, for I am. No. So John has already established in chapter 13 that Jesus is very aware of everything that is happening in this moment at dinner. We're told at the beginning of John 13 all of what Jesus knows. And what he does know is that his time has come, that his hour has come, that it is time for him to leave this world. Essentially, his time on earth is up. We also know that Je or Jesus also knows that the Father has put all things under his control, that he has power, it says, over all things. He knows the authority that he has. We're also told that he knows that he has come from God, and now he knows that he is going to be returning to God. And then we're also told that Jesus knows in this moment that someone is going to betray him. 
he knows that someone will betray him. So when Jesus says here, you are clean, he says, well, I'm not referring to all of you, for I know those I have chosen. Jesus is very aware. He's actually a known, known for quite a while that someone was going to betray him. If we go back to chapter 6, it's the first time that Jesus mentions someone will betray him. Chapter 6 is the story of this great miraculous meal that Jesus puts on for a crowd of 5,000 people. He feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. They're so blown away by Jesus' miracle, they go to him the next day hoping he will repeat the miracle, give them another free meal, and Jesus basically says no. Instead, he starts to teach really hard things. He starts to make them really uncomfortable. And he says things like, if you want to be my follower, you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And everybody's like, this guy is bonkers. We're out. So all of these disciples who are kindly, kind of on the fence make a decision in that moment to leave. Like, we're done with Jesus. We're going back to our old way of life. Jesus then looks to the 12 and he says to them, hey, are you guys going to leave too? Are you done as well? And Peter pipes up for the group. He says, Jesus, where are we going to go? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. Where are we going to go? In that moment, Jesus says this. Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the twelve was later to betray him. Jesus knew all the way back then. And we know that chapter 6 was a year prior from chapter 13. The reason we know that is because it says in chapter 6, verse 4, the Jewish Passover feast was near. A marker in time, this annual celebration that they had. The next time we see a reference to the Passover festival is in this place in John's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. That means a year has passed from chapter 6 to chapter 13. A year has gone by with Jesus traveling with Judas everywhere he went. Judas being the one who's in charge of all the finances at that time. Having sat around meals and dinner tables and events with Judas. Judas going out on Jesus' behalf. Being an ambassador for him and the movement that he's starting probably having one-on-one -on -one intimate conversations with Jesus about things of this world as they walk from one place to the next. They were partners in everything. And the whole time, every time, Jesus interacted with Jesus. Jesus interacted with Judas. He knew. He knew that Judas would betray him. And he might even, for all we know, known well from the beginning. The moment when he called Judas, he, Jesus may have very well known the entire time, which raises the question, why choose Judas knowing he'd betray Jesus? Like, why make that choice? Is it just so we can have a little drama in our Gospels as we read it 2,000 years later? Like, why make that choice? I think in part, what Jesus is saying here is an answer to that question. He says in verse 18, but this is to fulfill this passage of Scripture. And then he quotes, He who shared my bread has turned against me. Now this is a quote from Psalm 41. Psalm 41 verse 9. It was written by King David. And some scholars speculate and wonder, could David have written Psalm 41 during the season of betrayal of his son Absalom? When David was king over Israel, his son, who might have well been in line for the throne, launched this revolt to oust his dad so he can take the throne. And David is betrayed by his own son. So Jesus says it was to fulfill this passage. Now, when a passage is quote-unquote fulfilled, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's an Old Testament passage that is predicting the future and Jesus is then walking in that prediction, fulfilling what was predicted many, many years ago. To fulfill the scriptures, to fulfill the Old Testament could also mean a lot of what Jesus does throughout his ministry. 
meaning Jesus regularly embodies, retraces, reenacts aspects of Israel's story, in turn fulfilling the story, showing that that entire story is all a pointer to him. That everything, all the symbolism, all the stuff from the Old Testament is a pointer to who Jesus is. Go back to Jesus' birth. Right after he's born, what happens? Herod wants to kill this so-called new king of the Jews, and he gets word that he's just been born. So Herod issues this decree to kill all babies under two years old at the time that Jesus was born. Where do Mary and Joseph take Jesus? To Egypt for safety. In the Old Testament, when there's a massive drought and no food, where does the family of God's people at that time go for safety, to get food? They go to Egypt. Eventually, they will be called out of Egypt to go to the promised land. Jesus, in turn, after a couple years in Egypt, leaves Egypt and goes into the promised land, goes back to Israel. One of the very next stories in Jesus' life, one of the first adult stories in Jesus' life is his baptism. Where does he get baptized? In the Jordan River. As Israel comes out of Egypt and they make their way into the promised land, how do they enter into the promised land? They go through the Jordan River. Jesus is retracing the steps of Israel's story. After he gets baptized, in John's gospel at least, one of the first things he does is he goes to the temple and he cleanses the temple. He turns over the tables of the money changers and he creates this big stir and people get all offended by it. And one of the things he says in another gospel is there is one who is greater than the temple who is here. Jesus meaning that of himself. The temple was a place where it was thought that God's presence lived. It's the overlap of heaven and earth. Jesus comes creating this disturbance, saying there's one who is greater than the temple, and it's me. I'm the place where God's presence dwells. I'm the place where heaven and earth come together. It's all a pointer to me. Go back to John 6. This bread that they want, this miraculous bread that Jesus gives, they're like, do it again. Hey, can you rain down bread from heaven like Moses did while our Israelites wandered through the desert? What does Jesus say? That bread is me. It's just a pointer to me. I'm the true bread from heaven that you want. All along the way, he's embodying, he's retracing, he's reenacting Israel's story to say, that story is simply a pointer to me. That story is all about me. Even here, in quoting this scripture, a king who was betrayed, I'm embodying that too. Because Jesus is said to be a king in the line of David. He is the one who is the true king of kings and lord of lords. And if David was betrayed, Jesus is saying, I too am betrayed. What happened to David, the greatest king of all time, is also happening to me. And he goes on to give assurance of this in verse 19. He says, I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does, you will believe that I am who I am. That my identity as the Son of God, my identity as the true King, my identity as the Lord of the universe is true because I have predicted this. I'm telling you this so that you know, verse 20, very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you. He gets real explicit. Here's what I'm talking about. One of you is going to betray me. In the same way that King David was betrayed, I'm the true king of kings. One of you is going to betray me. And you got to believe that the disciples sitting around that table were like, what? Like, what? And of course, the very next thing they're thinking is, who is it? Verse 22, his disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. Now, if I'm at that table, you got to believe I'm like instantly going into detective mode. And I'm starting to look retroactively in my story of these guys for clues as to who it might be. And I would start with Matthew. 
Matthew, that tax collector. Like, even from the beginning, before Jesus called him, he already sold out his people just to line his own pockets and get rich. Maybe this is all just a ploy for him to get close to Jesus to make his wealth that much greater and build his empire. Maybe it's Matthew. Or what about Thomas? He's always a skeptic, doubting things, always pushing back on what Jesus says, isn't really sure that Jesus knows what he's doing. He's always a doubter. Maybe he's not really in. Maybe he's holding back. Maybe he's one who's been on the fence the entire time, and now he's found his way to move forward without Jesus. Or what about Bartholomew? I mean, what do we really know about that guy? <laughs> like, really? Like, we don't know anything about where he's from, who his parents are, what his occupation was. He's a huge mystery. Maybe it's him. Now, simultaneously, if I'm sitting around that table, going one by one, trying to figure out who it might be, I'm also building a case in my mind for why it's not me. Like, I've been faithful this whole time. I've done everything that Jesus has ever asked me to do. I've been by his side from day one. I left my old life behind. I left my wife and my kids to travel with him. I left my old occupation. I'm now just sleeping out wherever he takes us, just following him wherever he goes. There's no way it could be me. It must be one of these other 11. Now, Peter goes from speculation mode to full-on investigation mode, and somewhere along the way, he just straight up asks, who is it? Verse 23, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's thought to have been John, the guy who wrote this gospel, which is a little pretentious title to give yourself in your own book. He was reclining next to him being Jesus. Now, in ancient culture, ancient Jewish culture, if they're at like a dinner party, the table is probably shaped something like this. It was thought to be shaped like a U, and the guest of honor usually sat at the head of the table, which was kind of like the bend part of the U. And if that's the case, uh, Jesus would have been in that position of the table. Then we're told that John is reclining next to Jesus, so probably uh, right to his left. And then somewhere along the way, we read in verse 24, Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, most likely John, and asked him um, and said to him, hey, hey, psst. Ask Jesus, ask him which one he meant. So that probably means John, or Peter, is right next to John. And then Jesus says this in response, or rather, John actually, verse 25, leans back and asks Jesus. He asks him, Lord, who is it? Verse 26, Jesus answered, It's the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in this dish. Then, dipping this piece of bread... He gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. Which could mean that Judas is just to the right of Jesus. He's within arm's reach of Jesus. Now, I've always anticipated and thought that this moment where Jesus says all this and dips this piece of bread in a dish and hands it to Judas, I've always thought that was a very public thing amongst the whole group in the whole room. But we go on to see that nobody understood what Jesus meant. Verse 27, so Jesus told him, what you are about to do, do quickly. Verse 28, but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him, which could mean that this exchange between Peter, John, and Jesus happens privately, which could mean in this moment, it is only Peter in John, who know that Judas is the betrayer, because nobody else really understood what was going on. And we read in verse 29, since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. So Jesus says, somebody's going to betray me. Peter and John work together to crack a little investigation open to figure out who it is. Jesus gives them a clue. It's the guy that I give this piece of bread to, and he gives it to Judas. Nobody else really gets what's going on, but Peter and John probably do. And then John writes, Judas went out, and it was night. 
an artistic callback to chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and then John goes on to write, in Him, being Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Judas made his choice. He went out into the night, into the dark. All through John's gospel, he's making this contrast between light and dark to capture good versus evil. He'll go on to say in chapter 3, verse 19, the verdict is this, light has come into the world, chapter 3, verse 19, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Judas captures this perfectly. He chooses darkness. He chooses to portray Jesus. He goes out into the night to enact the betrayal and the plan that he's been hatching. Now, it's easy to criticize Judas. Right? It's easy to say, ah, Judas, what a traitor. But Peter, and all the disciples really, are eager and quick to try and figure out who is the betrayer. And then subtly, as the evening goes on, as we move into this next part in chapter 13, Peter, once he finds out, oh, it's Judas, he sets himself against Judas as one who would never do what Judas is doing. Never, ever betray Jesus. Because after Judas leaves... The evening continues. Jesus keeps teaching. He keeps talking, and he starts to say something about leaving and going somewhere where the disciples can't follow. If we jump ahead a little bit, this is verse 36. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? <clears throat> As Jesus has just said, he's leaving. Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. In other Gospels, Peter will say, even if everybody else, even if these other ten guys around the table, even if they betray you, even if they walk away, even if they turn their back on you, Jesus, I will never. I am all in. Remember the washing my feet? I said, get my head, get my hands, get all of it, because I am all in on you, Jesus. I will never betray you. And then Jesus responds in verse 8, Will you? Really? Will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, meaning this evening, before this night is over, you will disown me, not once, not twice, but three times. What Jesus is saying to Peter, is Peter, you think, you might think you're all in. Peter, you might think you'll never turn your back on me. You might think that you'll never be a traitor or be disloyal, but it's the moment when you think you will never that you're actually the most susceptible to doing it. Peter has found himself in that moment. Comparing himself to Judas after just having done this little investigation to find out, oh, it's Judas, I'm glad I'm not like him. And it seems as though part of what Jesus is saying to Peter in this moment is that when you're tempted to investigate and evaluate others, maybe the thing to do is focus on yourself. When you're tempted to evaluate and investigate, and you could maybe even say, compare yourself to others. The thing to do is focus on yourself. So if you're at work, and there's some controversy happening in the workplace, and there's a leader who's being scrutinized for making some decision or operating in some way, and all the people in the office are talking about it, and trying to figure out what's going on, instead of getting embroiled in all of their gossip and whatever, Maybe the thing to do is to focus on yourself. 
When you're on the playground at school picking up your kids and there's all this talk about the PTA meeting and what happened there and the president of the PTA making this decision and this person over there trying to sabotage that decision and then this event went poorly because these two are at odds with each other. Instead of sticking your nose into that, being like, oh, what's going on here? Maybe the best thing to do is to focus on yourself. Even when you're in a church context, God forbid, and something goes sideways, something goes down, and there's gossip running through the pews, and people are trying to point fingers and evaluate and investigate and try and figure out what went on. Maybe instead of getting all sucked into that drama, the thing to do is focus on yourself. Um, earlier this spring, um, it was a Sunday afternoon. I had gotten home from church, and one of the things I usually do on Sunday. Sunday night is pizza night. I was making pizza, getting stuff ready to make pizza. Um, and usually as I'm making pizza and prepping things, I usually go on YouTube and I listen to uh, my sermon from this day to keep like evaluating what I'm doing, just try and hone in and understand what I said and what I not said and what I wish I would have said and just think about things differently. And I go find it on YouTube because we post it on YouTube. And so I get all my stuff out to make pizza. I pull up my phone open up YouTube, and right away, the first post in my feed is a story about one pastor being in some fight and in some conflict with some other pastor. And I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I got to check this out for sure. And so I click on the, the video to find out what's going on. And these are two well-known pastors who have big national platforms and are big names. And Pastor A puts on this men's conference every year, this big men's conference uh, that meets in an arena. Thousands and thousands of men show up every year, and Pastor A invited Pastor B to be one of the speakers at this men's conference. Now, the opening night of this men's conference, probably on a Friday night, was like the most manly of man men's conference. They pulled out like a big monster truck into the middle of the arena, crushing cars. They pulled out a big tank and swirling the big gun thing around. They had like BMX bikers on dirt bikes doing tricks and stunts all over the place. And right before the first person was to get up to speak, they had this guy who was a stunt man who had one of these big poles. And I mean, he could just climb that thing like a monkey, just screw right up it. He could do that thing where like you grab on to the pole and somehow like you elevate your body perpendicular to the pole, climb up the pole with his body sticking straight out, and then he comes down and he rips off his shirt and he's big and strong. He takes a sword and he swallows the sword, and then he climbs back up the pole with sword sticking out of his mouth. He turns upside down and is hanging by the pole, somehow like wrapped his legs around the pole with no arms upside down, and then he just lets go. And he literally starts to fall towards the ground, sliding down this pole, and with his legs, grabs the pole inches before the sword hits the ground and was going to impale and go through him. I mean, that's the way this conference began, right? <laughs> so that all happens that night. Uh, probably Saturday morning, the next day, Pastor B, who was invited by Pastor A, who's putting on this conference, gets on the platform and starts to rebuke everybody about everything they saw the night before, specifically the stunt guy, saying because of that guy, the Jezebel spirit, as said in the scriptures, is present in this conference. He gets like two minutes into his talk. Pastor A is sitting on the front row. This is the guy who invited him to speak, who's hosting this whole thing and organized it, and he cut him off, and he called out his name. He's like, hey, you are done, and kicks him off the stage at the beginning of his message. And the guy just says, okay, and walks right off. He, th he then gets up and explains why, and then the conference keeps going, but there's this really weird aura over the whole thing, like this really weird thing. Now, as you can imagine, the internet had a field day with this. The internet loved this. And there's all these people posting about what happened and who was in the right and who was in the wrong and should Pastor B have said the things he did? Should Pastor A have repented for doing all of that? And then Pastor A, who hosts the conference, next week at his own church, spent his entire sermon addressing this issue with his congregation. Along the way, Pastor B is tweeting and posting all these passive-aggressive things online about what he did and why he did what he did. And after like 45 minutes of me like doing the deep dive down the rabbit hole of this controversy, I was like, what am I doing? 
Like, how is this moment helping me pastor Meadowbrook Church? Because what I found was through the process, I was evaluating, I was investigating, and ultimately I was elevating myself above these two, thinking I would never, I would never do what those guys are doing. I would never air dirty laundry publicly like that. I would never disrespect somebody who invited me to speak at some conference. I would never, over and over, I would never, I would never, I would never. See, when we are tempted to evaluate investigate, and compare ourselves to others, the invitation of this passage is for us to focus on ourselves. Because the truth is, we are just as susceptible to other people who turn away from Jesus, do this thing over here, fail in this way. We are just as susceptible. Given the right set of circumstances, the right situation, we might do the exact same thing. And Peter will go on to deny and betray Jesus before this night is over. And so the question is, what does it mean to focus on ourselves? Like, how do we actually do that? Do we go home and look in the mirror and be like, it's just you and me, buddy? You know, like, how do you, like, what does it mean to really focus on ourselves? I think the first thing is to be honest, to be honest with yourself. To say, yeah, sometimes when I investigate and evaluate others, the thing that I'm really after is trying to make myself feel better trying to compare myself in such a way so I can elevate myself and be like, I would never do that. God, you are so lucky to have me by your side because I would never, right? Sometimes that's how we do it. We focus on other people so we can elevate ourselves. So if we start by just being honest, like, yeah, that lives within me, then what we have is the opportunity to repent, turn from that, and then do the second thing that Jesus models in chapter 13, and that's deny ourselves. To take the lowly position. To not boast in our so-called self-proclaimed high position, but take the lowly position. Because that's what he does right before this moment. He gets up from his meal as everybody's there, and he washes the disciples' feet one by one by one, including Judas, before he goes out into the night. And then that empowers us if we're honest with ourselves and we deny ourselves, to then look outwardly and love and serve other people. Chapter 13 is all about love. It's all about love and service because as chapter 13 gets going, it says in one of the first two verses that Jesus, having loved his who were in the world, loved them to the end, showed them the full extent of his love, ultimately pointing to the cross, but in this moment lowering himself to wash their feet. He will say later in chapter 13, a new command I give to you, love one another. In the same way that Jesus fulfills the scriptures by embodying, retracing, and living out their story, we too can fulfill the love of God by embodying God's love to this world. By being honest with ourselves about where we're really at, being able to deny ourselves, lower ourselves, and love and serve other people. As we do that, we walk in the way of Jesus. We live how Jesus lived by pouring ourselves out, not so that we can get anything from it, but to embrace the way of Jesus, to sacrificially lower ourselves, to serve others. And as we do, the world around us, begins to vividly see God's love in action in our world in a way that they couldn't see it otherwise. And so you are called not to evaluate and investigate others, but you are called to live like Jesus, to love and serve the world so that they could know that his love is available to them in whatever situation they're in so that they can experience the grace and salvation that Jesus has. So when you're tempted to investigate and evaluate others, focus on yourself so that you can ultimately love other people. Lord, we thank you so much for the example of Jesus. We thank you not just for his example, but the way that he has extended himself to us, the way that he has poured himself out, the way that he emptied himself 
and took on the form of a servant and walked in obedience, obedience even unto death. And so, Lord, we give ourselves to you this morning. We open up our life to you and say, Lord, we need you. and We need your power. We need your spirit to live the life that we are called to live. And so, Lord, have your way with us. Help us to become the people you desire us to be. Amen.